Well, hello and welcome to Libanus Church. My name is Sam. It's a beautiful Sunday out here. Uh, before we begin our service, I just wanted to make a few announcements for everybody watching the video. The first announcement is to just remind you that we are now back in church every Sunday morning and every Sunday evening. And so if you'd like to join us, we meet at half past 10 on a Sunday morning and 6 p.m. on a Sunday evening. You would be more than welcome to come and to join and worship with us in person. I'd also like to announce that we are having a family service. So on 26th of September, we would love you to come and join us as a church. We're going to have a service led by John Woolley. And then afterwards, we're going to have some food together as a church. So please do make every effort to attend that on Sunday, the 26th of September. You're more than welcome to come and join our service and then we'll also have food afterwards. And just a reminder, we're doing back to school boxes. So for all of the children who would normally come to Friday night takeaway, we're going to be providing a, a box with uh, a leaflet for Friday night takeaway for mums and tots, a little pack of pencils, some activity packs and sweets. And these boxes are going to be distributed on Saturday. So if you'd like to help us distribute these boxes to all of the children at Friday Night Takeaway, please do get in contact with me and we'll uh, get you some boxes to deliver. So please do join us if you can in person on Sunday morning and evening. Please do come on Sunday the 26th. Join us for food afterwards as John Woolley leads us. And then please, if you're able, help us with the delivery of leaflets. Well, we hope you enjoy the rest of the service at Libanus Church. If you've got your Bibles, if you turn to uh, Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to pray before we begin. Father, be with us now. Speak through your word. We pray that it would be powerful and pointed and profound. Lord, speak to us. Amen. Well, we're going to continue going through and looking at the these core concepts of the Bible. And we're continuing uh, this morning to look at creation. And uh, we picked up a little bit on it uh, last week, but there is so much more to creation that we haven't looked at. Now, what I started with, and I'm going to continue to do this, primarily what I want us to think about is who is this God that has cr created all? Who is the creator? And I want us to see what the creation narrative tells us about God. And the one thing that uh, the Bible tells us clearly about God is that he is one being with three distinct persons. So I want us to look really at the fullness of who the creator is. The fullness of God in the triune nature of who God is. Now, I'm not going to attempt to fully explain the mysteries of the three persons and the mystery of the Trinity, but it is a clear truth. And people often ask me, Sam, do you understand the Trinity? Do I understand the Trinity in its fullness, in its majesty? And the answer is, no, I don't fully understand it, but I fully believe it. And so we're going to look at why it is we believe in this God who is so different from us, and yet a God who brings himself so close to us. It's one of the, the most confusing and hard to things, it's hard to understand things about the creation account. But as we look at the God behind everything, we cannot see anything other than God is so different from us. We are singular, but God has three persons. And even from the very first chapter of the Bible, God reveals and explains to us a, just a glimpse of the triune nature of God. God is one being and three persons. And surprisingly, my first point is persons. And some people think that the Trinity is hinted at a little bit in Genesis, but it's not really there. But if you read other bits in the New Testament, you can find the Trinity. I think the Trinity is a little bit more clear. 
I think we, we read, it's obvious when we read the Genesis account that there is more to God than how we are. He is greater than us. He is bigger than us. I think it's explicit. Verse 26 is a prime example of this. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. There's an emphasis here that, who's God talking to? There's an emphasis here that there's a, a plural form. We know there's only one God. We know that the angels were not needed for God to create. And so this is God talking about himself, using us and our and it just takes you back, doesn't it? How vastly different God is from us. And this difference that God has from us should really provoke us and point us to worship. God is different from us. I think amen and hallelujah to that. For if God was the same as us, well, if God was the same as me, you'd have problems. But he's so different. His very nature, his very being, is something we cannot understand or fathom. In its entirety, in its fullness, God is so different. And some people look at this and go, I don't like it, I don't get it, I don't understand it. But for me, I think it's a, a comfort. I am comforted knowing that God is so much more than me. That's what we saw last week. We looked particularly at uh, God the Father last week. The power, the might that God had to create. I am so glad God is not like me. And the primary agent in creation tends to be, when we think of the creator, when we think of God, we tend to think of God the Father. And uh, I spoke a lot about that last week. The sheer power and presence and might to speak with such an authority that things come into being as you ask. Now, if any of you have ever had builders round, you will ask them to do something. And the finished product doesn't always look exactly as you asked it, does it? Maybe the shade of blue is a different color than you wanted. Maybe things are in a slightly different place. Maybe it's three weeks behind the schedule. But when God spoke, his power, his authority, Everything responds to him. Things that didn't exist came into being exactly as he wanted them, exactly as he planned them. Our God is a raging fire of power that we cannot understand. This is the God that we're here to worship. Not just a little weak God that uh, we'll give one Sunday a week to, but he is the Lord of all. He's reigning and ruling in everything. There is no one like him. There is no power like him. There is no force like him. We worship one who is mighty and powerful. We spoke a lot about that last week. The second reference to God being triune comes in Genesis 1 and verse 2. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. What we see here in creation is that in the midst of God creating and forming, the Spirit is present and involved in some extent. To some degree, the Spirit of God is involved in creation. He's present there. Psalm 33 and verse 6 says this. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. We've spoken about that, haven't we? That by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their hopes. The breath of his mouth is in reference to the Holy Spirit being involved. Often in the Old Testament, the, one of the key things of God's Spirit is life. That idea that there's a life in humanity. There's a life in us. And here we see that life-giving spirit involved in creation. I love it in the New Testament where it references the Holy Spirit in uh, John 14 and verse 26. 
John 14 and verse 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remember all that I have said to you. I love this description of the Holy Spirit as a helper. In the midst of creation, the Holy Spirit is there. The Spirit is moving, the Spirit is working. It's fascinating, isn't it? To just wonder how big is a God that you worship. I think I said it last week, but however big your view is of God, it is not big enough. God is all power. God is spirit. God is life. Just look at what everything that God has done. Into everything there is life and beauty. And often this is attributed to the spirit. Elsewhere, I think in Genesis 2, you've got the idea of God breathing life into man. And then we come to the third person of the Trinity, the Son. And I think you all know what passage I'm going to quote here, don't you? Now, the one passage that begins, the, the first three words are the exact same. 1 John, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Clearly we see here that right at the beginning of all time, we spoke about eternity last week, God has had no beginning. He just always has been. And in the beginning, who was there creating but Christ himself? Jesus was there at the beginning. What does that mean? That means that Jesus is eternal. Jesus has no beginning. Jesus wasn't just born and then he existed, but he is an eternal being. And it says more than that, that everything that was created was created through Jesus. But I want us to think a little bit about the beginning of 1 John 4. And it's one of the most important things that you will hear today. John 1 and verse 4 says, In him was life. In him was life. And if you want true life, if you want everlasting life, then that can only be found in the God who breathed life into all things. People are constantly looking to extend their lifetime for as long as possible. People are looking for the greatest thrill. And that's why people do stupid things like jump out of aeroplanes. People are constantly looking for something that makes them feel alive. But if you do not know Jesus, then you do not have life. You have no hope, no future. But in Jesus, there is life. He is the source of life. There's no such thing as life until God spoke it into existence. Colossians 2 and verse 9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. That's a great verse, isn't it? The fullness of God, the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. When Jesus was walking around this earth, the fullness of God was in him. Why? For he is God. Jesus Christ is God. Now, might be sitting there going, oh, well, I know this, this is obvious. I learned this in Sunday school. But the sad reality is that the majority of churches that are currently open and currently preaching will not testify that Christ is God. This is not a doctrine that everybody unilaterally believes. This is something that is constantly under attack. Christ is God. Some people think he's a, a good godly being. Maybe he's a, a top angel. It's all heresy. It's all lie. We read here that through everything that was created, it was through Jesus Christ. In the beginning, Christ was there. 
no beginning, no creation. And we are increasingly moving into a time when even the church that purports to be the church of Jesus Christ, purports to be the bride of Christ, will not say in fullness, Christ is Lord. Jesus is God. People are shying away from it. I wonder, in your lives, do people know that you think Jesus is God? Not subordinate to the Father. Not underneath in some hierarchy. But do you believe Christ is God? Do you believe him? Do you believe that there is life in Jesus Christ and death outside of him? Well, we've looked at three persons and I just want to say, if you get three people together to plan something, you'll have four different ideas of how to run an event. That's what I found in my life. You get three people planning something, you get four different ideas. There's an old joke that's told in various forms, but it's about one man who gets trapped on a desert island. And this man is stuck on a desert island, and after about ten years, he gets rescued. And they save this man on the desert island, completely deserted, but for one man. And they see three buildings set up. And they ask him, what are these buildings? And he says, well, that one is my house. And that building is my church. And they say, but what about the other building? He says, oh, that's the church I used to go to. Is that you? Constantly changing your mind. Constantly being fickle. But what we see here in Jesus Christ what we see here with the Holy Spirit, what we see here with God the Father, is that they are aligned in all of their wills, in all of their aims, in all of their ambitions. They are one. There is a unity that we can only dream of. Many of us don't agree with ourselves. But here, God, the fullness of God, there is complete unity, complete agreement. And this is why we know that each person of God is completely the same in terms, of its, in terms of their authority with one another. We know that they've got different roles. We know they've got different functions. It's what theologians call the economic trinity. They have different roles, but they are all equal in terms of authority. And again, we have to be very careful as some people downplay. Some people say, oh, well, I think Jesus is God, but just not as much as God the Father is God. You have to be very careful about these thoughts and these uh, incorrect doctrines. There's no hierarchy within the Trinity, for they are all equal. They are all perfectly together. They all agree. Their wills are all equally aligned. They are together. I'd go even further than just saying they're together. They're not just together, they are one. Deuteronomy uh, 6 and verse 4 says, Hear, o, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He's one God. There's no disunity. There's no civil war. God is so great. Isn't he? He's so beyond us. One God, three persons. My next point we talked about persons. My next point is people. As we think about creation, I want us to focus on people. I haven't got time to look at all the animals and the trees and light. But I want us to focus on what is unique and distinct that God creates. At this point in the creation narrative, God has created the earth, the stars, the moon, the animals, fruit of all different types. And then verse 26 and 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image. After our likeness. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. Now as we think about this, I, want to, I just want to try a little thought experiment. I'm going to say something. I'm going to see what pops into your head. Other people. Yeah, I wonder what popped into your head when I said other people. 
Many of you think, I, I hate other people. They can't drive. They're always in my way. There's always queues wherever I go. A lot of them are just rude and vulgar. Some of us might have enjoyed the pandemic. I was talking to one person and they said, I've loved this pandemic. I haven't seen a single person for months, and I love it. And hopefully that's not you sitting in you in church, but I wonder, is your view of people, oh no, I've got people around. I don't want them around, but I have to be polite and nice. Because when we see and view God's creation, there seems to be a special emphasis and distinction about mankind. Everything that God created is good. I mean, I, I can't imagine it. We, we know that sin has uh, infected earth. I mean, can you imagine what a strawberry tastes like not marred by sin? Imagine how beautiful trees would look not stained by the sin that we brought into the world. I can't imagine what, what the, this Eden, what, what the garden would look like without any sin, without any wrong. Wherever you looked, it was all good. Why? Because the God that created it was good. But there is still, even amongst complete goodness, there is still distinction between mankind. Let us make man in our image, after our own likeness. That's fascinating, isn't it? that we are made in the image of God. That there is, in some way, all of us here today are made in the likeness. We are made after God's likeness. There's similarities, characteristics, traits. And yet, when we often think of other people, it's already negative. I think we need a greater and bigger reminder of the dignity and worth of each other because of the dignity and worth that God has given us. In many ways, if I can put it this way, I think the mankind was the jewel of God's creation. It was the thing that he loved. It was the thing that he put to be above everything else. We see that uh, from verse 28 onwards. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven. God has created all of these things and then with man he says, look after it, rule over it. There's a distinction about us. I think we're constantly living in a day in a culture that says, you're nothing special. You're just ordinary. You're just average. But we can't all be average. Some of you are worse than average. But look at the love that God has for mankind. Be encouraged at the love that he has for his creation. There is something unique and special about us. I love verse 28. And God blessed them. I just wonder. Does the doctrine of creation change the way that you think about other people? Does it change the dignity and respect you need to be showing people? I think I mentioned this when I did the Afghanistan video. That Christians should have a higher and a bigger view of human life than anybody else. We should have a greater love and respect for human life. Why? Because God has made us special. And yet, many of us, maybe some of us sitting in this room today, do not value our fellow human beings enough to tell them about the life they can have in Jesus Christ. I wonder, do you value people's lives enough to tell them about Jesus Christ? I wonder, do you love your neighbours enough to share with them the answer to eternal life? Because if you love people, if you care for people, then surely you would make every effort to exalt Jesus Christ to them. If I loved people, 
if I have a view of mankind like God has a view of mankind, if I appreciated the, the soul, if I appreciated the eternity that we're all facing, maybe I'd tell more people about Jesus. Maybe my prayer life would be so much different, so much more infused. I honestly believe we need a bigger view of God. But also, to some extent, we need more worth on who people are. Now, there's been a very tragic and sad, uh, tragic uh, celebrity death. And I, I don't know if you've heard of this particular celebrity. But he's called Geronimo. I wonder if you've heard of uh, this celebrity. Now, Geronimo is a, um, an alpaca. And uh, Geronimo the alpaca, uh, unfortunately, contracted TB. And there was this big argument about whether this animal should be allowed to live, even though it could pass TB to, to humans and to other animals. And uh, very recently, the decision was made that it was too dangerous to have this animal running around with TB. However, this did cause something really interesting to happen. A widespread public debate began about humans and animals and what is worth more. And uh, I just want to read one quite worrying statistic, really. A question was asked, and uh, the research was carried out and polling was done, and it says that 49% of people think that human lives are worth more than animal lives. So only 49% of people think that the life of a human is worth more than the life of an animal. I think that's really interesting. And the one thing that's come across to me throughout this debate is that we have forgotten the worth of people. We've forgotten how God created us. We've forgotten how God has looked at us. I think it's probably more fundamental than that. I think we've forgotten that we've got a creator. I think we've forgotten that we're made in his image. We've forgotten that we're made in his likeness. We've forgotten that we've got a soul. We've forgotten that we are loved by Jesus Christ. We have forgotten that Jesus Christ has died for us. We have forgotten the cost and the price that Jesus paid to redeem us. We have forgotten the value of worth that we have, not because we're good, but because God created us good. And next week we'll look at the, the problems of that and what happened later. I wonder, do you really love, respect and value people, not just as bits of atoms stuck together, but as a being, beings with a soul, beings with an eternity ahead of them, Beings who need to know Jesus Christ, who have got no other hope other than to fall into the arms of Christ. Maybe you need that reminder today that you're not special because of anything you've done, but you are special because of God's hand upon your life. You are special because God loves you, and if you're a Christian, then more so. You're not just special because you're made in the image of God. You're special because God's in you. Because he's dwelling in you. Because he's living in you. And if God values humanity, the question is, do we? Do we love those around us? And I'll say this, you cannot value people, but, but not tell them about Jesus. You, you can't love someone and then not tell them about the greatest person there is. It's a bit like when you, uh, if you remember when you would come home from work and you've had good news and you fling open the door and you shout, I'm home, I've got news. And it would be the first thing you'd want to say, wouldn't it? If it's really good news, if it's really exciting news, you don't forget about it and mention it three hours later. If we have the best news. If Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection really is the best thing, then we need to be telling those that we love. If you do not evangelize to someone, if you do not pray for someone, then you do not value them enough. 
And even as writing this sermon, I've been writing this thinking, maybe I don't value people enough. May God convict us and remind us how precious his people are in his sight. My third point, and by far the shortest point, but I wanted to leave, uh, end on this, and my third point is perfection. Verse 31, And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. Our God is so good that everything he makes, everything he touches, turns good. You often hear people like that, don't you? That whatever they touch, it turns brilliant. Whether it's painting, whether it's cooking, whatever they turn their hands to, it's brilliant. Now, in light of what I've said about loving and valuing and giving people dignity and respect, we're not allowed to hate those people. But deep down, you see somebody who's good at everything and you go, oh, oh. You sort of get embarrassed if you're both doing a drawing and you're sitting next to somebody and they've done the Mona Lisa and you have not even drawn a straight line. You think, I'm nowhere near that. I'm nowhere as good as that. But look at God. Everything that he made was complete perfection. He looks at it and even, I mean, this, this takes me back. God himself saw what he had made and he says, it was very good. The almighty, perfect being, even God himself had to admire how good his creation was. Sometimes if you're doing a bit of DIY, you do something and you stand back and you go, even if I say so myself, that is a good job. It's similar to this. God is almighty and perfect and holy. This is what he has built his creation to be. I cannot stress, I cannot explain, I cannot understand how good God's creation is. And the reason why I can't explain how perfect God's creation is is because the creation that I'm living in now is still beautiful. But every element, every atom has been marred and corrupted by sin that has entered into the world. And next week we're going to explore that sin, but I, I want to leave you on a high, and I want you to leave you thinking, this God who is perfect, this God who does all things good, one day you will be with him in a new heaven, in a new earth. That is our future. What our greatest hope is, is not a nice happy life here, but a new life that is to come. For all who know Jesus, there is a life that is bigger and better and greater. I wonder, do you know Christ? Are you going to that new heaven and new earth? Amen.